I was muted. I think you probably might probably weren't, but I was. And I was doing most of the talking. God bless it. It was such a great intro, too. It wasn't awkward at all. It was super awkward. No, it was super awkward. Yeah, I, and I had. Um, but here we are with this. Oh, we were both muted. Can you hear Ed now, Bruno? Ed is still muted. Let's see why that is. I can hear Ed just fine. I wonder if it's my Arctis. Um, Ed, can you talk and let's see if we get you... Th no, I'm not, not getting anything through. Hmm. Should have done this before we went live. Fuck it, we'll do it live. All right. Nobody's hearing any of that. I know exactly why, because I set both of them to game. Here we go. Now, Ed, you should be... Can you hear me now? Are we in business? I think we're, I think we're in business, because I can see the, the audio little, moving. little line moving. Yeah, the line is moving. Perfect. Fuck it, we'll do it live. Here we go. Uh, so, tonight... We are doing something a little different. Normally we do uh, actual plays of, um, I mean, mostly we're, we're doing a couple 5e books. We're doing Call of Cthulhu, but uh, tonight we're going to develop a homebrew world that we're going to be playing uh, uh, at a table game, but also online here. And uh, the name of the world is Navishla. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had the players instead of doing maybe i mean maybe not instead of but in addition to a session zero let's build this world based on what the players want to see so uh ed has agreed to be the first guinea pig and we're going to talk all about what ed's character is going to be in this campaign and figure out what his backstory that he has in mind for his character how that you know not just fits in the world, how it actually shapes the world that we're going to play in. Uh, so that's why the the name of this uh, program tonight is called Building Navishla, because we're going to build it together. And uh, let's just start off with uh, having Ed do a little intro of himself. I mean, God, if you've seen me on this show, you've seen Ed. <laughs> it's true. I am ubiquitous. You are ubiquitous. Uh, to the point that I've started to ask to, to apologize for taking up too many spaces, Not at but, all. uh, I'm, I'm Ed scenario Volpus in the chat. Uh, and, uh, I am excited to be here. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do, I mean, like, seriously, we, we do all of this together. This is ridiculous that, that like, I, I should probably have to introduce myself too. Hi, I'm Paul. Uh, we made this channel and. Ed was good enough to come into it, and here we go. Uh, well, this is this is what interesting. Is it? is it good? What do you make? What do you? Drinking? It is. What are you drinking? I I have I'm trying to branch out. I've made a mixed drink. This is called a New York sour, which is a whiskey sour with a splash of red wine on the top. Uh, and I made this with uh, some Knob Creek um, maple. Uh, bourbon that was gifted to me by a friend of the show sith lord dave nice uh and uh the thing i learned about knob creek maple bourbon is that it tastes like you're drinking maple syrup and so i needed to find a way to cut it I... so i have made uh, this whiskey sour which is it's a very interesting flavor i i think it's good hmm. but you give it a percentage yet of good uh jury's still out jury's still out okay Jury's still out on percentages. I could drink this. I'm okay. So it's I mean, it's, it's a, a it's an it's a blend of flavors though. There's a lot going on there. Would you call it a melange of flavors? I don't know. I'm not that worldly. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I am not as daring as that. I'm having a classic. I'm having a uh, a a, a uh, whiskey. Uh, it's a bourbon Manhattan up high though, just because it's classy. Uh, and so, uh, I'm actually one and a half into this. So here's hoping, uh, you know, this stream doesn't completely go off the rails. Uh, we respect strong choices in this house. That's right. <laughs> All right. So the first question is, um, let's just, let's just start off with a, a question about why do we do this? Like, what do you, what do you want out of a role-playing game? 
for me, the 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 basis of a perfect game, a per like a, the the re experience that I'm looking for is uh, shared storytelling. Okay. Uh, I want it to be very cooperative. I want it to. I want everyone at the table to be an active participant in telling a story. Um, that's what I value out of role playing, and that's what uh, when I, I I DM a lot of games. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, I don't want to just be running the game. I want to be a storyteller along with my players. So I like to in include a lot of player buy-in with pr helping to craft the story. So that's one of the reasons I'm excited about this prospect is that we are we're we're laying a foundation here for all of the players to build the foundations of the world itself, uh, in addition to the individual stories we might tell at the table. Right on. Yeah, that's that's really important to me too. I think it can like, I mean, I'm I, I, I'm gonna be not altruistic here at all and just say part of it's because I'm lazy. Like I don't want to create all of it. <laughs> like I, I, you know, I think it's fun to have other people come up with stuff and surprise me at the table. I, you know, I think it's just fun when somebody well, goes. Well, and I, I can this. I you can know? only imagine the level of buy-in that you'll have from players that have had a hand in crafting the world. That that I hope is true. Yeah. Well, and I I think that's what we'll we'll find out over time. So let's get into this. What are you thinking, Ed? What, are you, what, what, what let's let's just start off. Uh, you tell me. Where do you want to start off? With? You want to start off with like uh, origin? Because uh, you know. All right. Here's the thing. I've gotten real uncomfortable with the race term and. I yeah. should have gotten yeah. uncomfortable with it a long time ago. And I, I really like origin. I, I'm not so sure how I feel about species. Uh, it feels a little sci-fi. takes me out of the fantasy world. Yeah, but, species uh, was always the term used in, in Star Wars games and that sort of thing. And it, make, it, it does feel more at home there. Yeah. Um, I fall back on species. I think origin is great. I haven't really gotten... Uh, that hasn't hasn't become habit forming yet, as far as that term. Yeah, yeah, me neither. But that's I think where I want to go with it. So, um, in the spirit of that, what origin are you thinking of playing? I am leaning heavy into my roots with uh, my my old standbys. Uh, I'm going with halfling. Um, if we were going by the book, it would be the lightfoot halfling. Uh, that, those are sort of the bonuses that I'm going with, but. Uh, Lightfoot and stout aren't really going to be applicable as far as I'm concerned as when creating my little culture. Perfect. Yeah. Reskinning majorly a thing here. So like I you know like let's 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 not reinvent wheels with a lot of mechanic changes unless it makes a lot of sense or if it's fairly apples to apples because I don't want to do a shit ton of play testing to make sure we haven't broken anything. But like reskinning, sure. Let's do that. Uh so uh, but let me ask this question. You say you're going back to your roots. Uh, you, you dig playing the halflings. What is it about halflings? Well, those of, those of you who might be watching or know me personally, I'm not a very big person. Um, I'm, I'm a short guy and I live in a land of tall people and I kind of like the, the exaggeration of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always been a big fan of, uh, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not a religious person, so I don't want to get too far into that. But like the David and Goliath story, mm -hmm. I like the I like the the little person who can can overcome a lot of things, um, and I, I I like the wonder of it. I also like the uh, and, and this is really specific to the character, but I like a lot of the uh, the attitude that is often tied to halflings. Uh, they're, they're often, they often have a lot of sort of built-in wanderlust, mm. uh, and, uh, adventure. And I think that's baked into the, the bonuses that the origin has with things like their, their advantage against fear. fear um, yeah. they're, they're brave, uh, mm -hmm. despite being diminutive. Yeah. Being, being we, yeah. Okay, that's cool. I, I asked that just because it also maybe gives a, a clue for some story ideas too, you know, like. Mm -hmm. What would be cool for your story? So we're looking at a halfling, mm -hmm. reskinning the Lightfoot a little bit, right? A little bit. I, yeah. I mean, I think the only reskinning I'm really doing is I don't know that they would use that term. 
to, to reskin, I mean, or they wouldn't use light 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 foot. Okay, I mean, I mean sure. light foot doesn't really yeah, match with yeah. sort of where I'm aiming. Yeah, um, no, I get you. Okay, so it's less a reskin and more of a rename. Okay, I don't know what that name is yet. We maybe we'll think of something clever. Sounds good. And if there's anybody in the chat, I mean, I would, I'm, I've got my eyes on the chat. If anybody's got ideas they want to pop in there uh happy to to hear ideas as we go, we cook this along um all right so we got a we got a halfling um i guess the next cl you know question usually asked is what class are you thinking it, well i think before we get to that i want to delve it, it, a little bit more look, into the origin let's do it um we'll... so another thing that is pretty prevalent in Halflings and hobbits going back to Tolkien. Uh, I know Greyhawk lists this specifically. Uh, Tolkien was big on it. The hobbits and halflings are not into water. Mm. They are often uncomfortable. They don't like Tolkien wrote about hobbits don't like boats. Uh, Greyhawk talks about how halflings avoid water. They don't like to go in water. So I decided that I want to turn that on its head and I'm making an, um, um, a really water based halfling society cool like uh and and you and i've talked about i don't want to pretend that we haven't had any conversations yeah, before yeah. this uh you and i've talked a little bit about that um so sort of a seafaring race actually not race sorry uh uh, uh culture culture uh, yeah uh, cult yes very a, re a seafaring culture um almost to the degree of uh of, of almost entirely um Pelagic. Is that the term? I have no idea. I what did I what did you, did you say pelagic? Pelagic. Uh I believe is the term for uh creatures that uh above water creatures that spend all of their lives out in, over the water. Love that. I did not um, know that term. That's awesome. Uh I think I remember hearing it about in reference to an albatross. That's really, really cool. So Although you know, the, you haven't you haven't like given. <laughs> Prunus says there are too many big words that hurt my brain. I I yeah Ed Ed uh, Ed taught me. Well, there. I've been I, given I free nothing. reign. I'm... <laughs> yeah, you do you do you man. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll pelagicize all over the place. Um, the uh, we'll just let he's rolling. He, yeah, let just, him go. Just let him go. Uh, the uh. The idea being, I mean, you're not giving them gills or anything like that, so they are. No, they're, they're, they are they still are... surface dwellers. To, right. uh, like they're still surface surface creatures. They they need to be above the water, but I think that um, I'm I'm taking them to a new realm for the halflings and going to a very uh, really focused on um, seafaring and and living their lives at sea. So. Would uh, just so I get a picture here, um, are they living in smaller boats? Is it a flotilla? Is it like water world? Do they have like uh, like platforms? And what are you thinking? So I'm I'm seeing it like a flotilla. I think their main civilization, their main sort of civilization center. It's not so much a city; it's a flotilla. Um, I think it is centered around one massive ship boat. Uh, I'm also picturing this uh, as a very like Polynesian style boat, so a okay. lot of catamarans, a lot Out, of outrigger canoes. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, I, I'm picturing one very large uh, raft or, or type of, of craft like that with uh, and drawing from sort of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec uh, I, uh, floating islands, floating gardens uh, within that um, that are all sort of one large slow moving craft okay and that brings me to is it nomadic migratory like are you following the fish kind of thing through um well and that gets to that gets to sort of the origin story of what i'm of what i'm coming up with uh okay. and we uh, so your prompts included some of the sort of the origins of the origin okay um so where they how they got to where they are um my theory and i don't know how how much if we want to get ahead of ourselves as far as uh some of the lore that you have shared with us about the world um 
No, do it. Uh, just... The pantheon of the world. The pantheon of the world, uh, as you've told us, is a number of dragons. And there are a, there were a finite number. There are no lesser dragons. There were only the ancient worms. Yes. Uh, and this society grew up um, either protected by or in Congress with or or, or interacting often with um, the ancient bronze dragon. Um which they call Ixilanthus. Okay. Um, you and whether that's to spell his... that and drop that in the chat for me so that I sure. Can... Uh, whether that's his name, their name. Um, I don't think Ixilanthus is gendered. Doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, but uh, Ixilanthus or Ixil or Ix, uh, depending on the stories that you're hearing, okay. um, was sort of their their patron in a way um and bronze dragons are aquatic they live a lot of their lives underwater and in the ocean and i think that this culture sprang up essentially migrating with ixalanthus oh okay so as as they traversed under the water the this culture had it would travel above the water along with them uh, and that's what took them out to sea, and and they continued that. Um, and uh, it wasn't. The stories are that he was that Ixalanthus was always there, uh, and they always knew where they were, and then they followed the dragon. Um, and that is perhaps less true anymore. Um, but that's sort of their their origin and their their. When they took to the sea, that was why they did it and how they got there. Their uh, their folk ways are mm -hmm. they follow the dragon, and the fact is is perhaps Ixalanthus is not actually guiding anymore, but their folk way is, is that they follow this, and perhaps there's a pattern that they've discerned, or they follow, you know, whatever their priests, priestesses, their clergy do. Well, is that and possible? and. I think that uh, I think it's probably become more of a, a sort of a traditional migratory society, okay. in that they seasonally move to where uh, you know there's a lot of of fish or the vegetation they're looking for or mm -hmm. other things that they need that they're traveling to. But those pathways, at least as the stories are told, originated with Ixalanthus leading them there. Cool. I like that. That's really cool. Um, but you mentioned sort of priesthood uh, and and clergy, um, because this society grew up almost hand in hand with Ixalanthus in a way. They've never really viewed it as a religious thing. Okay. The dragon was was almost a community member. Sure. And so they it was more of the they were the teacher. Ixalanthus taught them to build boats and sail the seas and, and taught them how to find these things and, and, and that sort of thing. But they never really viewed it as a deity. They, they didn't, because it was early on so, so mutual, it was, a, it was almost a peer uh, in a way. And certainly Ixalanthus had, had knowledge and, and, and wisdom beyond their reckoning, but there was still a a, a, um, a camaraderie there, mm -hmm. and uh, and so they never quite made the connection to the divine with that. Okay. Um, they understand that other cultures believe that, and they understand that other cultures deify dragons and might even deify Ixalanthus. Um, and they they get that that's a belief system. But because it was, there's an element of of, um, of faith that requires a belief in something you can't know absolutely. That's true. And they they didn't ever have that because they did know Exilanthus. So they never really developed faith in that sense. They developed trust and 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 a relationship, but. It never quite somehow the seed never took root for them to think of it as faith. Okay. So it's not a religious culture in 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 any of the traditional senses of that word. It 
it so that would then ask the question of are there clerics and yes if i so, think how do they work? yeah they have a they have a very um nature is sort of uh, um, shamanistic approach to the elements okay uh and so the elements or it, nature it, yeah often druidic or nature or really sort of more spirits than deities okay. um I, I think they they can certainly they sort of see a spiritual connection to the world as opposed to a divine okay um and I haven't really sussed out whether there's there's sort of that sort of spirits of the ancients kind of element. I, I think there could be. Sure. And we don't have to figure everything out tonight either, you know. Uh, but it's it it's it's interesting. So, um, I like that. So that this is a culture when they run into other cultures, um, who are referring to perhaps the bronze dragon. Mm -hmm. know it as Ixalanthus and these other cultures may have another name for it mm -hmm. and they don't see it as the divine they just see it as part of like a like a like a sea brother like a like a sea yeah, and, or sea sibling and and a part of the natural order uh, it's because of the the connection to to nature and nature spirits and that sort of thing um Ixalanthus is a part of that order as they are okay very cool. And and they would view the other dragons similarly as uh, they're a part of that order. Um they are not it, certainly I'm sure that there have been members of this culture who have taken up with the divine ideas that other cultures have and and believe that. I we're not we're certainly not going to create a monolith here. Um there are there are myriad belief systems and and these th this culture is no different in that regard. Cool. I like it. This actually seems like a good time to switch screens and bring up this map here. Um, Ed, there's no way of you seeing that unless you're watching Twitch. Um, well, I actually have the, the big map up on my screen. So okay. I... Uh, I am on the Ervo Kale map. And what we had spoken about, um, and I'll bring up I, so you can see my pointer here on Twitch. We had spoken about uh, your migratory pattern being here on the north side of Ervo Kale. I think is what uh, we said. For for part of the year. Okay. Um, then... I think that they they range. They have a, a huge range. Um, they don't move quickly, but they move constantly. I am going to open up Navishla. Um, so on your big map, you have the, the Keeling Sea, or Quailing, depending on which Matthew Mercer you're going to listen to for the pronunciation <laughs> of that word. Okay, I apparently need to... But he did specify that he did the research, and both are correct. It so. is that is true. I'd actually <laughs> already had read that. Um, all right. So I have now got the world of Navishla up here, and if we zoom in uh, and move over here, Ervo Kale is where we're planning to start this campaign, and the Kale I pronounce it the Quailing Sea, uh, but Keeling would work as well. Uh, we had talked about you being located within the Keeling Sea. Um, uh, and I think to the north as well. And a little bit to the north. Um, okay. I think I would say predominantly in the Keeling Sea, the mm -hmm. Quailing Sea. I, I'm okay with either. I don't, but um, predominantly, they spend a lot of time there, but they do venture up into that northern sea as well. Okay. Um, which is not not yet been named. I've left a lot of this open either for me to name or for people to tell me that they're from that far away and tell me your name and I'll place it on the map. Um, so uh, I had named all of the surrounding areas of, you know, you have to have something to build on. So I had named all of the surrounding things to Ervo Kale, but everything else is a little, mm -hmm. is a little less, um, 
you know, none of these lakes have names, none of these, you know. Uh, so, um, being here, how often are the halflings uh, of this of this culture running into other people? How often are they interacting I, I think, with other? I, frequently. Frequently, are they traders? Um, are they? They are. They're 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 traders, and they have a they have a very welcoming culture, and so they end up trading a lot with other seafaring folk, um, as well as as venturing into the onto land and going into the the civilizations of other people. They're they're certainly not shy about any of that, um, and so they have a they, they're they're never going to shy away from those opportunities to to experience the world um i think that they if, for example to use Urvokale as an exam as a uh, an example here um i think that you know once a year they spend a significant amount of time off the coast of Urvokale and they have a lot of trade back and forth at that period at that point um probably in Devana as well and then other cities along the coast okay um, one yeah. of the other questions that you'd asked about in your sort of prompts was about um, how insular they are. Um, and I don't think this culture is insular at all. I don't think they have a lot of long-term visitors from a lot of other origins because everything is on boats made sized for a halfling. Okay. So other cultures just might not be all that physically comfortable when it's all boats made for small people. Yeah, what I was trying to get at with that, you've you've answered. So I'm I'm glad you you brought that question up. Is it's not so much insularity. I mean, you can be. Uh, I think I was getting sort of at, you know, how homogenous are they? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to 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 lean into the fact that we're using large words. Um, like, is it is it a diverse culture? Are there humans and tieflings and Asimar, et cetera? Or is it predominantly a halfling culture? And you've just answered that question. It's yeah. predominantly a halfling culture based on sort of sizing and yeah. and just the way they've gone about life uh, on the sea. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, it, you know, maybe the time when we start play, maybe there is a... a, a a big people vessel that's been sort of lashed into the flotilla it could absolutely okay. have happened. Sure. Um, it wouldn't be one of their boats. They wouldn't build something that big. Um, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make sense to them, but it's welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, got it. Okay. So moving, uh, anything else culturally, like, is there anything looking at this map that you want to sort of claim um, for, like, is there a city that perhaps your character has been to that something happened and that we can place on the map here? Or do you want it to be on Urvokale? Or... So my concept for my character specifically is that she has not been a lot of places yet. Okay. Um, she is, as we start venturing out on that sort of voyage of, of discovery, self-discovery and world discovery. Um, so she has not had a lot of experience other than visiting the towns where they trade. Okay. Um, and I think that she has a, she has a good rapport with a number of merchants and traders. Um, I think um, her, her sort of, family or clan had uh, her, her sort of smaller family unit within the community, the culture had uh, were well-known traders. And so she has a lot of sort of connections to the ports uh, and, and different merchants and traders in the ports. Um, and a lot of that comes from, I'm going with the sailor background, um, which has, um, which offers that you can always find passage on a ship. So I thought, well, how does that happen? It happens because you have connections because you know, people, Okay. You know people who have ships that that do this sort of thing, um, and I thought, well, that, that makes a lot of sense that that she grew up sailing, specifically sailing, but also making these connections with other sailors. That makes sense. So, uh, kind of zooming in then, from that point of view, 
back to Ervocale. Um, the one, the one s town that I know is on the coast that would be a port is Sentasset. Um, now that doesn't mean that has to be the port that your your character has been to. Perhaps there's something. Okay, why are we frozen? Don't do this to me, Wonder Draft. Don't be that. <laughs> Don't be that program. Uh, okay. Um, we could be doing some stuff up here, or, and when I say up here, I'm I'm kind of cursoring around the northern coast here, um, mm -hmm. or anywhere else that that you might think would be an interesting port of call that starts your adventure as you move into Ervocale. So you had you had indicated that we're starting in Ashenvane uh, and shown us where that is on the map, and so based on that, I was thinking that. Um, so I, I maybe we should backtrack a little to a little bit more about yeah. my character so that we can yeah give a name rather than yeah let's say do my that. character is doing this. Um, so uh, so back to where a question you'd asked previously uh, about class and that sort of thing where we're where i'm going um my character is uh i what they refer to as a dragon child or a tamaiti uh terakoa mm -hmm. is the term that um they use for it um which is she's a she's a dragon soul sorcerer okay um she was born with bronze scales wow. um and her and and this happens in their culture, and it's a, they're referred to as dragon souls or scaleborn, uh, or dragon child or scaleborn, um, and uh, and they're 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 sort of given a lot of leeway because they're they're viewed as having a, a great destiny, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it sort of. One of the other things, the sort of, uh, of seeds that you threw out was think of this as sort of like the uh, the Greek gods, uh, and so I think we can all imagine how some of these halflings ended up having dragon okay, scales. Yep. <laughs> That's exactly what I was hoping people would pick up what I was laying down on that one. Yep. <laughs> um, but uh, so my character's name is Kaiwahi Rangi. Kaiwan. Uh, Kai Kaiwahi. Rangi, Kaiwaki. okay, which means sky chaser, mm. um, and uh, and so she is on this this voyage of uh, self of discovery, and she has decided the first step of that is that she needs to reach the highest peak of the mountain she sees on Ervocale. Okay, um, to to get as close as she can to the sky. Um, now the, 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 the people have, her people have, um, other ways of reaching the sky. They have, uh, domesticated, uh, uh, flocks of seabirds, sort of like a cormorant, but much larger, um, that they keep as, uh, as, you know, pets or domesticated animals that they fish with, they hunt with. Um, there's some of the cormorants, um, get large enough that they actually they have scouts and messengers that ride these massive seabirds um and so that was one way she could reach the sky but the, they don't fly that high and she felt she needed to get higher so kaiwahi is is traveling to Ervocale to to because it is inundated with mountains and she wants to get to the highest peak she can um and so with that, she set sail in her own little boat, um, a one or two person outrigger canoe with a sail. Uh, and she knew of a trader in that port city um, that I'm, I can't, I'm blanking on the name. You just said it, but I can't uh, quite read it on the stream. Sentasset. So I she knew of, there. she knew of a trader in Sentasset who, um, who was a harbor master that, that she had, Meet, met on several occasions. She trusted that he'd be able to keep her boat safe. 
Uh, and so she traveled there um, to sort of stow the boat where where she could get back to it if she needed it later and set off over land. Uh, and that's how she's going to end up in Ashenvane. Okay. So she stowed the boat in Sentasset. And I'm going to zoom in yet again, everybody. And it's going to ask me to save that I named the high, or I've labeled which is the highest peak. Uh, so save and then open. Let's go to the Corsa Valley. Okay. This isn't as helpful as I would like, but the sh um, the Corsa River does go to Santasset. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, she could go follow along the Corsa River, or she could take the trade route up directly into Ashen Vein. Um, does it matter? Maybe it doesn't. My, my thought is that she went overland to Ashen Vein, partly because uh, I think she, in sort of preparing for this journey, she asked a lot of questions. She talked to a lot of people who'd been to the land and been and spent more time inland, um, and she knows. That, for example, to traverse the mountains, she's going to need a lot of cold weather gear that she does not have, okay. because she, her culture doesn't need that. Um, so, one of her plans is to get to town. Um, really need to earn some coin to do these things, but but she knows of adventuring and how that can be lucrative and how she could use that to make some money to buy what she needs to traverse these mountains. And she's not in a hurry. This is she understands this to be um, about the journey more than about the destination. She certainly wants to stand on that peak and experience what that is, but it's about getting there. Got it. Okay, so this is this is bringing me to a point where I feel like I probably should have started off with a couple of like I haven't I've named a couple things. And I've got a couple broad sketches, and we've we've mm -hmm. talked about a few of them. One of which is there are fifteen dragons. Um, they rep they are represented by the the five chromatic, five metallic, five gem dragons. That's it. It's all that they're all there are, and they are they are gods, and they walk amongst the people of Navishla. Um, the rest of that will play out as it plays out. The other bit um, that I think uh, I was wanting to make sure was like a, a sort of a thing with this is everybody is a bit isolated. And so uh, this is this is a very every it's it's not a cosmopolitan world necessarily yet nobody's surprised by anything because it's also a deeply magical world so that's the only two things i really know for sure in that like i still want there to be wonder like if you run into something new it shouldn't be like oh yeah i've heard about them i read about them in stories uh <laughs> So everybody is sort of a little isolated. Um, that said, there's no reason why there wouldn't be anything that you just said. So like when you get to Ashen Vein, it's not like every it's not the Mos Eisley Cantina. It's mm -hmm. it's 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 gonna be mostly humans and actually dwarves in Ashen Vein. And they've heard of other folk. They know that they exist. Some of them have come through town, but none of them seem to stay, go back to their own folk. Um, and I, I don't want to have a whole lot of getting into the evils of that, but I still want there to be, when you run into somebody you haven't seen before, some wonder with that. Like, I, I don't want to mm -hmm. lose the fantastical element of, I, you know, uh, part of what, part of what Forgotten Realms sort of bumps me out is it's like everybody's like oh look it's a griffin <laughs> you know but it, that's that's a flying horse eagle <laughs> that should that should still be cool uh and so i i, I kind of want to bring some of that wonder back 
Um, so that's one of the things I was, I, I don't know that it's even possible, but the, the keep the fantastic in the fantasy, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but that said, everything is possible. So, um, all right. That, that was just, I, I just realized I hadn't like set the, the stage here. Um, and, uh, the, I think the, the other thing that I haven't really set the stage on is that we are starting in, well, I, it's, I think it's pretty clear that we're starting on the Island of Ervil Kale. We're starting in the very small town of Ashenvane and that the, the largest city in the Corsa Valley region is Hazelshade. Um, all of these things are, you know, they're, they're a day's travel away from each other. Um, so it's not like people are, you know, just going into town for the day to go to something else. They, it's a, it's a journey and it's got to be intentional. Uh, and Ervo Kale, you know, sort of to just go back to it, uh, is a very small part of the world. Uh, the other thing that we know about Ervocale is, is it's got a southern south of the equator sort of climate and so as you go south it gets colder it gets warmer as you go north um, but the equator is more along the lines of right where that isthmus is right here up above the Quailing Sea so it's not like you're near the Antarctica or anything does mm-hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. I should probably yeah. draw that on. So, uh, just those are the only things that I have set. So everything else, Ed, as you're saying it, that's what's becoming canon. So, so you are looking for the tallest mountain on Ervo Kale, and I've just identified which one that is. Oops, I didn't want to make new. I didn't want to the Corsa Valley. The Corsa Valley is on the way to your goal, but you would have to travel quite a ways farther west from there. Um, but as you said, you know it's part of the journey. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. And she knows she needs to make some coin to get what she needs to climb a mountain. Okay. Have when we when we first meet, and I'm sorry, I, I need to hear the name again. Uh, Iwahi. Wow. Uh, I'm, oh, I can put that in chat. Yeah, that would help me out. Um, hey, Chris Jones. Kaiowahi, when she arrives in Ashenvane, like when we start our game, how long do you want her to have been there? Uh, not long. I think she's just arriving. Okay. Or or has, has very recently arrived, with not necessarily just arriving, but very recently arrived uh, on the road from uh, Centacet. And she has been traveling alone? Yes. She Does she have any sort of um, pets or uh, familiars or anything? Sorcerers don't really nope. have familiars, do they? No. Nope. Um, okay. Nope, she does not. Um She's she has a a walking stick and a dagger and you know the 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 fair the fair few uh, accoutrements that a sorcerer needs. Okay. All right. And what would be like getting kind of Call of Cthulhu-ish with this? What would be Kaawahi's Kaiowahi's biggest hope aside from the the, the uh, ascending the peak. Um, um I th- her her biggest sort of hope and fear are really tied together. Okay. Um because there is this expectation culturally on the scaleborn uh of this great destiny. Um she suffers from a lot of imposter syndrome okay um associated with that um and uh really intensely wants to prove that to be true oh she she wants to prove to herself more than anyone 
that that destiny is is true that oh, that the scaleborn okay. destiny is a real thing got it um so her biggest hope is to to realize some great destiny and she doesn't know what that is yet um but she's called sky chaser and so she wants to get as close as she can to the sky okay now i am going to ask this question and then i'm getting at a very specific like end result I'm going for, so I'm going to keep sharpening the question as we go. What is her biggest fear? Well, that is that's the that's the imposter syndrome. The imposter. Her biggest syndrome. fear. The, her biggest fear is that the the scaleborn destiny is bullshit. Okay. And that that she'll never amount to anything. What would a physical manifestation of that fear look like? Hmm. Yeah. Take your time. I really don't know yet. Okay. <laughs> um, I think if I think sort of in the immediate in in reference to her immediate goals, if she can't even get start that ascent, yeah. Uh, if something prevents her from even getting to that, that would be a physical manifestation of it, like a paralysis um, or a restraint. Or yes, or 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 simply a realization that she isn't physically capable of doing it. Okay. Um, I think she would push herself really hard before she got to that point. So it would need to be physically incapable. Okay. Perfect. Going on a different tack here now. Um, getting into your people's culture. Mm -hmm. uh, they followed uh, they f they f they followed the dragon around. Uh, looking for the name again here. I know you put it. Ixalanthus. Ixalanthus. Was there an enemy? Is there is there a flip to that coin? I'm sure that there are. I'm yeah. sure that they've had a, a number of them. Being very diminutive. They, I think, have often been mistaken for um, easy prey. Okay. Um, whether that is from pirates or whether that's from creatures or whatnot, um, I think probably the biggest threat to them is more from people than creatures. Mm-hmm. And creatures are certainly there, but because they view that as a natural order, they're not, they, they don't view that as an enemy. Right. Okay. Um, um, and I think that they try very hard not to have enemies, but they have them. Hmm. Um, and I haven't fleshed this out, but I imagine it could very well be that there are, there are sort of pirate fleets that they have to deal with on occasion. Okay. And sometimes they're that uh, that is challenged by their welcoming nature. They have they have a difficult time with that. So perhaps like sea bullies, like uh, yeah, but like like not like bullies, like like slaughter parts. Of like uh, that that brings me to a question: Are you the only flotilla, or are there several flotillas to your culture? Um, I had been thinking that it's the one massive flotilla okay but there are hundreds of boats that are not physically connected to it but are part of it maybe come and go yeah yeah so i think that there are a lot of the flotilla itself is is i think flotilla by its definition means a number of ships that travel together yes. and i think that that's less what we have here um i, I think that there is that element to it but their main sort of culture base is one massive vessel that's all sort of lashed together and when you say massive how massive are you thinking um like would i don't it cover know a i mean a, no it's not no. 30 miles no it's, no it, it's it's like the size of a small city Okay. So it might so, be it like might be two three miles maybe 
It might be two or three miles, yeah. Okay. Um, like and I, and... I, bridges, uh, a lot of like rope bridges between them, and sails everywhere because it sails, it moves. Yeah. Um, and so that there, there are, there's a whole sort of, there's a whole cadre of um, of sailors whose entire job is to coordinate sailing that vessel. Yeah, I would imagine there's got to be some kind of communication system that's highly specialized, like some kind of semaphore I, or light well, and system. I, so I, um, I think it's semaphore, but it's also tied to kites. Oh, when I was picturing this, kites, when I was yeah. picturing this in my mind, I I see just hundreds of kites flying off of these this vessel, and I think that there are some of them that are that are color coded and and sort of if you've ever seen a stunt kite, how they can they can be yeah, yeah. steered around. Um, maybe that's how they communicate how to control how to steer the ship and work in tandem. And so, like, when the kite goes a different way, all the different, because this is massive, I mean, each sail, yeah. some sails just have to come down at a certain, you know, quickly. And yeah, then, and, yep. Uh, and it, there's, like, the larger sails in it have teams of 10 <laughs> different people that are, are all coordin- working together to coordinate it. Some of the smaller sails on the outer sides of it might have one or two people that, that, that work that sail, but they all have to work together. And they might take cues down the line, to some degree. And you, you named this culture, right? This is I haven't yet. Okay. All right. Man, I'm just picturing the 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 battle map on this thing, you know, like <laughs> be amazing. Uh Okay. Um man, that's super cool. Uh So we've got your culture, we've got your class, we've got you. What background are you playing? Sailor. Sailor, you mentioned that. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. And let's see, how open are you to having met one of the other party members in route to Ashen Bane, if that were something that, as a session zero thingy, kind of happened? Right, that'd be great. Okay, cool. Um, um, I mean, part of the thing with playing a sorcerer is that I'm a high charisma class. Uh, I'm very personable. Okay. How old is your character? 19 or 20. Okay, young adult. Yep. Very adolescent into adult. No, adult. I mean, okay. Old enough to be adult. Okay. Okay. All right. I am wondering if anything interesting happened to your character over land on the way to Ashenvain that you think either would be an interesting sort of session zero um any or is it just been a a series of delightful camping trips up along the river as you head northwest i don't know i haven't given that any thought yet um i mean some some of this has got to be my job i don't need to put it on yeah yeah. um But, but I will be excited to know if something exciting happened in, in that in that trip. Fair enough. <laughs> I can I can I can I can I can manage that part of it. All right. Uh, this, oh, it, uh, Chris. Chris says you meet a bog witch. because uh, I believe that's what he is uh, aiming to play in the game is a bog witch. So that'll be interesting when we get to Chris's. Um, development of where the bog witch came from on wherever the bog witch came from uh but have we covered i think the ground we need to cover i don't know let's see yeah. i was looking at there's my... oh i gave a little bit of thought to um some of your 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 question about treasured possession yeah um was um the the main vessel does one of one of the sails is is massive. It's probably a hundred feet tall, and it needs to be replaced from time to time. And she has a a, a piece of embroidered sailcloth from the last time it was replaced that is sort of her or sort of tethered to home. That that tethered to home. Okay. That she carries with her. Um, and, and she has her own boat, which is that 
even more so, but she can't carry that with her. Right. I had some questions about the boat. Now, uh, we had, uh, it's halfling-sized. Mm-hmm. How many halflings would it fit? Comfortably two could probably have four at a time for a short distance. So a halfling and a medium creature maybe could make do. Yeah, I don't think the medium the medium creature would ever be wholly comfortable. Mm. I don't think that there's capacity on that boat for a medium sized person to like <laughs> stretch their legs out. Right. Yeah, they'd be they'd be uh knee biting the whole time. But uh Yeah. But it's it's a catamaran type vessel, right? It's a, I picture it as an outrigger canoe. Okay. Uh with a sail. With a sail. Okay. Super cool. Okay. I think I don't I think what I like the idea is as you had said you hadn't been in Ashen Bane long. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm gonna save any kind of discussion of Ashen Vane for if anybody says they're from there mm-hmm. and we can have them name some parts of that and we can explore that in another episode of Building Navishla. Um I think what um Kaiwahi, uh, I'll get it eventually. Ka- Kaiwahi? Kai Kaiwahi. Kaiwahi. I think she'll be aware that there is some system of governance here on Urvokale. Would know that from being well, the, the traitor thing, upon the you'd ocean. You'd was the you'd ask oh. about the governmental sort of structure of the society. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that they. So I had thought about that that they're likely um, sort of a council of captains. Okay. Um, the, there, there is one sort of the the elder captain of the of the whole thing that has to be the final arbiter of what the main vessel does. Um, but there's a council of of ship captains that are, are sort of the ruling body, like an advisory council that has quite a bit of authority to act unilaterally and I, if needed. And they have the the council as a whole is the governing body. The the one elder captain um that sort of that person's only sort of sort of step above anybody else is that they have the final word for that ship okay um because in a moment in a storm or in a in a situation where that ship needs to make a decision it needs there needs to be one person who can just do it that might be even a cultural thing then Mm-hmm. Like that's a that's an expectation. In, yeah, in those, actually, in... I could I could see that becoming a thing in an adventuring party, right? Where yeah. she views it as there needs to be one person who, in a crisis, can make a decision, and we go with it. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to be dithering about when the storm's about to capsize a whole section of the the main ship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's all right. Cool. I... And I think that I you know getting digging into that a little further. I think with things like a storm, that main vessel, because it is lashed together, there are times when they have to cut parts of it free and to weather a together. storm and bring it back yeah. together. And so it might constantly reform <laughs> by their own machinations. So you know you never quite have a lay of the land there because this section where where the blacksmith might was yesterday might be on the other side of the boat tomorrow. Yeah. You, ever, <laughs> you ever watch uh Robotech back in the day? I did not. Oh. Uh, <laughs> such a <laughs> d- dumb show and yet so formative on my life. But yeah, the Matt Cross <laughs> Matt Cross City kept getting jumbled up in the middle of the SDF one and uh who knows where our restaurant's going to be tomorrow. <laughs> but perfect that's exactly it. All right. Um, I mean, the legend CD. I am Chris Durkin. Chris Durkin. Oh yeah. If you. Oh right. Yep. I've, I've I've put it together. I I was like compact disc. Was Dawson alive for compact discs? Dawson's just about fifteen minutes behind. Yeah. <laughs> His stream's on a delay. Oh. I, <laughs> um. Uh. So, let's see if there's anything else we are 
missing anything else that you have you really want to stamp on Navishla. And you'll have plenty of opportunity to do this throughout the game, but like right now, is there something you want to see in this world that that you know we can build right now? And it may not even affect the game. Like you can say, hey, it's somewhere on the other continent. I want there to be a volcano named whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna say affirmatively, no, there is not because I I want to experience it. Okay. Cool. All right. Then I feel like we may have come to a natural conclusion to this uh, world building here. Well, that's an opportune time because I my drink know. is cold. I need to get a new drink too. Uh, and then I'm going to hang out in the General 942. Um, wait, which channel? Wait, what? well, wait a minute. Because I have the other you're, one that says you're, don't you're go. 30, you're, you're off by 30. Do you have a private channel I don't know about? I don't. You, you've got moderation rights, you would know. Um, it's uh, General 972. Or we could be in Don't Go You're in cheating here on me, Paul. Ever. I am cheating on you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna, I think we're gonna wrap up building Navishla for tonight. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, I think Ed, I think, uh, set the bar pretty high for how these conversations can go, but I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next ones and looking forward to seeing what the, uh, other players who are planning to play in this world come with that they want to see happen. Whatever your character wants to have happen, we can build it in. And I froze the stream by moving away from the Discord pop-out the, the only caveat that I would add to that is whatever you want to have happen, but with a in the mindset of yes and. Always yes and. Always yes and. Whatever um, you want to have happen. Also, once we're done with this, the Dungeon Master is still the Dungeon Master. Like... Sure. You still got to have, like, all the stuff is happening behind the scenes. You still want to be surprised by the story. Just going back to what you just said, Ed, like, you, you don't want to know everything that's going to ha happen. But uh, I think I think, uh, I think think we're going to have a ton of fun building this world together. And then uh, once I've got a really good framework on it, then we'll see what surprises. I mean, anybody who's Dungeon Mastered knows as soon as you start the game, the players say something and all of a sudden you're like, that's way better than what I thought. <laughs> you, you, you like alter the game slightly uh, to meet the expectations. So, uh, but yeah, this was a ton of fun. Thanks for being the first guest, Ed. Uh, yeah. Yes, I had a good time thinking about it. I've, I've, it's given me something else to occupy my brain when uh, work sucks. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think my problem is this work isn't sucking that much, uh, but wanting to be thinking about this is making my work suck more. Uh. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. <laughs> but uh, so if this is, uh, I don't think, let me check, let me look here and see who's watching the show here. Uh, if you are new to uh, uh, hanging out here at, at Roleplay Give. Uh, I don't think I've ever even invited people to our Discord. It's just really not been a thing, but I certainly can do that. Um, if you're interested in getting to know us more, I will pop in a Discord link uh, into the chat. But otherwise, um, if you are part of our Discord community, I think we're going to I'm, I don't know if Ed's doing it, but I'm going to go uh, into the, the General 972 and hang out. Well, I probably need to mix another whiskey drink, and then we'll see. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going <laughs> to make another whiskey drink, maybe another lager drink, maybe a cider drink, uh, and then I'll get back up again. I'm and... going to go get knocked down. Oh, okay. Well, as long as we do it in the right order, I think yeah. I, I probably screwed that up. Okay. Well, in any case, thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you on the flip side. Cheer, everybody. <laughs>